You're all in for a real treat uh, this afternoon, um, something that I know that uh, you'll all uh, remember very, very uh, well. It's, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce our two distinguished uh, speakers uh, uh, today. I'll um, start uh, ladies last, I'll say. Okay. Peter first. So uh, Peter Janetta, uh, you all know him very, very well. His, uh, he was uh, one of my predecessors uh, here as a chairman of the Department of uh, Neurosurgery for many, uh, many years, has had a, uh, and continues to have a illustrious uh, career, really uh, developing making many major developments in the neurosurgery, uh, most notab notably, you know, really the, uh, the popularizing and demonstrating the efficacy of uh, microvascular decompression, particularly for trigeminal neuralgia and hemifacial uh, spasm, and clearly uh, created a legendary uh, training program, which uh, we're all indebted uh, uh, to, and clearly we're part of, so we're all part of the same neurosurgical family with a first degree of approximation. So Peter, thank you very much, and we look forward to hearing uh, uh, your comments. Uh, I am uh, uh, extremely delighted also to introduce uh, Mary Ellen Dandy Marmaduke, uh, who came uh, all the way from uh, Portland, Oregon, to uh, talk with us uh, today. Um, as you all know, she's uh, the daughter of uh, uh, really uh, one of the key fathers of uh, uh, neurosurgery, uh, Walter Dandy. And uh, I asked her, um, kind of off the cuff, would you come and visit us at Pittsburgh and talk <laughs> to us about your father? And she was uh, you know, very, very uh, generous uh, with her time and, uh, and uh, made the trip all over uh, from uh, the other corner of uh, our country uh, to here. And uh, you know, as uh, uh, we all know all the amazing work that uh, Walter Dandy uh, did, uh, including uh, something for me as I, as I researched uh, um, when I gave my talk as chair of the CV section about the history of cerebrovascular neurosurgery, and Walter Danny clearly just touched every little corner, and uh, you know, he uh, was the first person to clip an aneurysm. He clipped a PECOM aneurysm, and for all the neurosurgery residents, uh, and again, I uh, want to welcome also our, our neurology colleagues, a paper that's really, you should all read it. Actually, I'll, I'll send it to you all. It's beautifully re written, but remember, this before angiography and before uh, um, uh, you know, imaging studies uh, was a, uh, a, a physical examination diagnosis. He went in found the aneurysm, used a silver clip, uh, which uh, Harvey Cushing developed. Uh, so they worked together uh, there. I know they had, uh, there, were some, there were some rivalries uh, between the, 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 uh, the two of them. But uh, again, it's, a, it's really uh, a pleasure and an honor to welcome you. Also, uh, uh, Polly Marmaduke, uh, Walter Dandy's uh, daughter, welcome. And thank you for, for, for coming uh, here and uh, visiting us. And uh, you know, it's, uh, We'll hear uh, from uh, from uh, Mary Ellen and from uh, Peter uh, uh, their words about the history of neurosurgery, which Walter Dandy is in many ways the history of uh, neurosurgery. And at the end, you know, there'll be ample time for you to ask him questions. So again, thank you so much uh, for coming, and we'll look forward to your presentation. Well, Robert, thank you. It's really, a, really a pleasure to be here, and with my kissing cousin, <laughs> PJ. You know, because uh, he and I have known each other for quite a while. So um, before I, and my daughter Polly is here, right. She helps with the TV, with the, the um, PowerPoint that I'm going to do. But um, I want to tell you first that just because I, I, you could figure this out, but it's just easier if I tell you. I'm 88 years old. I'll be 89 in July. And I'm on a walker. It's nothing neurological. It's just a weak leg that I twisted and I need physical therapy to get it back, so there's nothing you guys can do about that, but I have to do it myself. So, um, why isn't that moving? Well, let's do it this way. Okay, my dad had, there were four of us children, and he had been an only child, and he wanted to have a big family. Okay, here we are, and this, the four of us, and, um, 
That's my brother, and my sister Kitty is next to him. She lives in Boston, in Wellesley, where we all went to college, and, um, and she's now blind, so she sent me some letters that I'll quote from somewhere in this, in this show. And then I'm the next one, and my brother used to call me a sawed-off, hammer-down runt, because I, <laughs> I was a preemie, and, um, but I also never grew to be very tall. And then next to me is my sister Maggie, and she lives in Eugene, Oregon. And when I was writing the book, I, I was a zoology major, and everything I wrote sounded like a lab report. So I said, Maggie, would you help me with this, with this writing? I was writing the book. And she said, would you like me to rewrite it in your voice? And she'd done a lot of that for her husband, who was a professor of German. So the, the, the story is, and the pictures are mine, but the words are basically hers. So. Um, and my brother, my sister Kitty, did a genealogy of my father and found out that a lot about his past, his, his ancestors. And this is my kissing cousin, because Peter and I met in San Diego in 2001, and it was immediately, we just struck it off right off, Peter, right, didn't we? And so he would, uh, this is, as Peter said, this is when we were both walking. <laughs> so. But I, he would send me articles, and I'd call Peter and say, Peter, explain this to me. So he was a great teacher. She, he just explained things that I didn't understand. And other teachers were Ed Laws, who was at Harvard with you, Robert. And because um, he, he had promoted the first book about my dad that I'll show it was written in, was, uh, in, two, in uh, 1982. And we all went to New York for that, pick, that uh, opening. And, um, that's where I met Ed Laws, and so he became another one of my teachers. And then, um, and then Raphael Tamargo, the other Walter Dandy professor, is also somebody that's helped me out. So, okay, now we're going to talk about my dad's early life, and then Peter will talk about um, his contributions to neurosurgery, and then I'll talk about the fam our family life. And family life was really important to my dad, and having kids was. He'd been an only child, and he just wanted to be sure that, you know, he had lots of children, and he had four of us. And for some reason, he was very proud of us. He used to take us to the hospital and with him to watch surgeries and to meet patients. Now, this is my grandfather, John Dandy, who grew up in a little town in northwestern England, and, um, and then he moved to the town of Barrow to get a job. He was, um, my sister did a genealogy, and she found no father listed. So he was probably, you know, just he and his mother and a sister, I guess, lived in this little town. And then his mother moved up with him to Barrow in Furness near Scotland. And he, John got a job on the, um, on the railroads and up there. And um, he joined a church called the Plymouth Brethren, a fundamentalist church. And then my grandmother, Rachel Kilpatrick, came from County Armagh. She had finished high school. And she was a very bright, driven woman. And she, she, he always referred to her in the letters as the boss. I'm sure she, he really respected what she did, what she knew. And this is the little house. And this is my dad when he was a baby. And my grandmother made all my dad's clothes. She was a seamstress. And she'd come out over to Barrow as a seamstress and a mantilla maker. She was a very talented seamstress. And this is the little house they lived in. And there's chicken wire all around the house because she raised chickens and sold chickens and eggs. And um, if you can't, could see it closer, people this time just dressed up for pictures. So they're all dressed up, and my dad is holding his banty rooster in his arms. And then this is my dad. Then he went to this one-room schoolhouse, and this is a picture of him when he was a little schoolboy in his cap. And this was a one-room schoolhouse in Sedalia, and it was mostly children of English, Irish, and German immigrants. And that's, he's right there in the corner. That's in the book, too. And his, he did very well in school, but he was sort of a troublemaker. He dipped the girls' hair, pigtails into the ink, and, you know, they'd have to keep him busy, because he, was, he wasn't busy. He was getting into all kinds of things. So then his teachers, he graduated from grade school and went to high school, and he was the valedictorian of his class. At, um, in the high school in Sedalia, and he gave his talk on education. Education was very important to him and remained so all of his life. 
And so he went across the river to, to Columbia, Missouri, to, um, to the, the State University there. And he had, was on scholarship. I love this picture of him. He's looking so Joe College, you know. And somebody said, he, he really, um, he brought a cow into the dormitory once. I mean, this is, <laughs> you know, pretty primitive stuff. And, um, but he, um, and then he got, he was awarded Phi Beta Kappa and Sigma Psi, which was then an undergraduate um, award. And um, one of his roommates said that he worked hard, he played hard, and he slept hard. <laughs> so he was very determined. And then, <clears throat> He, had, he did a year of medical school at Missouri, and they suggested that he go to Johns Hopkins because they only had a two-year medical school. So he went to Johns Hopkins, and you know, just imagine him out of this small town into the big city of Baltimore. And um, pa Polly and I were in Trinidad on a birding trip one time, and we met this man from St. Louis, and I said, well, my dad was from Sedalia, and he said, oh, well, your dad must have been a hick, and I said, yeah, he was. And the guy later found out who my dad was. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but he was kind of a hick. I mean, he just, he kept his small town values. He never got to be a Baltimore snob. He was, he was uh, very, very straightforward and direct. And, and um, so that was Johns Hopkins. And he worked under William Halstead, who was one of the big four that founded Hopkins. And then his other mentor, as I say, tour mentor was Harvey Cushing. He worked under Harvey Cushing for a while. This is a talk that I gave last year in Seattle. And this young man that's sitting next to me is my brother's grandson, Michael Dandy Patz. And he had just worked with Rich Ellenbogen, the neurosurgeon, on a surgery. And after the surgery, Rich said, Mike, you did a really good job. And Mike said, thank you. And he said, you might be interested to know that my great-grandfather was Walter Dandy. And Rich said, well, you should come and do a talk for us. And he said, no, my great-aunt Mary Ellen would be better. So the two of us worked on this talk. And I'll, this is a clip from it. Uh, and, and, and this is where I, I learned about um, uh, my grandfather. And so this is. Um, he was an anesthesiologist. Yeah, right? this is this is Walter Dandy Jr., my grandfather, um, an anesthesiologist, and uh, me, of course. And this is Raphael Tamargo, who's um, uh, now the uh, Dandy Chair of Neurosurgery at Hopkins. And um, so this this picture was taken uh, when I was in college uh, as a neuroscience major. Um, so I was. Uh, exposed to that group of, of neurosurgeons early on and, and uh, learned their stories about uh, my great-grandfather and um, uh, and the most distinct thing I remember was uh, that he had uh, according to them discovered the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid um, but a couple of years later when I decided to go to medical school um, I thought well um, I don't, I don't want to go somewhere where um, I'm going to be expected to, to produce such great things. <laughs> so maybe if you go a little bit north, um, they might not know your name and uh, they might still give you a medical edu education. So um, this is uh, where I started off on our, and um, I remember uh, on our first day of orientation there, um, uh, they showed us the uh, mannequin lab, which is in the basement of this building, the Tostasi Med Medical Center, and uh, apparently it's where uh, Cushing's lab uh, uh, was actually originally um, as part of the Brigham. And uh, uh, when they introduced it, they, uh, I remember a remark about how this is where Cushing had discovered the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. <laughs> um, so that's what sort of got me curious to go a little deeper into the history and, and, and do some more reading. Um, and so I'll go back then. This is in um, 1910, right uh, around the time that um, uh, Dandy met Cushing. So this was when his first uh, exposure to research as a senior in medical school. He uh, <coughs> did this project where he reconstructed a, a human embryo that he had received um, from 
uh, a woman who had carefully extracted an early abortion uh, with a stick that she had whittled herself and then fixed that in formaldehyde, sectioned it in uh, 10 micron sections, and then reconstructed that from his uh, uh, images that he saw on the microscope. So it was um, really apparent early on that he had a, a, a distinct sort of uh, anatomical talent and, and way of sort of putting things together. He also got his master's degree for that paper. Mm. Um, so here he is in uh, 1910, uh, just graduating medical school, and then at that time had huge uh, respect for, for Cushing and was uh, really enthusiastic about signing up to be his um, <coughs> research assistant in the following year. Um, and you know, this is in the Hunterian uh, lab for experimental surgery there. And so his first assignment with Cushing was to um, uh, describe the blood supply and um, uh, nerve supply to the pituitary gland, and um, he actually published that really quickly. Um, he actually uh, did those drawings himself. Yeah, you know, designed by him. Right. And um, Let me say about this. Yeah. at the time he did this work, the basic anatomy wasn't even known. I mean, they so his progress from there on is, is really part of the story. Okay. Um, but so after this, uh, it seemed that he, he didn't really uh, have a lot of guidance from Christian was sort of left to his own um, devices in the lab and became uh, really intrigued by uh, the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid at that time. So this is a letter from uh, October that year. He chooses to find he's very enthusiastic, gives me authority and fleet charge. Um, and he's all around the world and uh, doesn't get around much when in town. Um, and then uh, this is um, later that year, his, he's already been doing some experiments with dogs, um, uh, just trying to come up with ways to, to understand the flow. Um, and this, this quote here, I think, is um, uh, the more I learn about it, the more astounding I, I, I find it. So I'll just read it to you first. Because um, she was around when I was operating on a dog, um, asking what I was trying to do. Uh, and I said, to produce a tumor in the aqueduct of Silvis. It says, why the animal sure to die? Um, about an hour later, showed him how I did it. And... Um, told him we would develop a method of examining the interior of the brain by means of a light and this catheterization of the aqueduct of Silvis. He smiled a little and hesitated to say anything. Um, and I sort of uh, read this over and over and uh, tried to imagine uh, sort of what his uh, perception was at that time. And what's really amazing about it is that Cushing didn't um, believe at that time that uh, and, and for a few years after that uh, obstructive hydrocephalus was uh, um, uh, was a real thing in humans uh, and then it, so not he's he's producing obstructive hydrocephalus here um, by including the aqueduct with a tissue and then he must have shunted the flow somehow um, and uh, and then, uh, so he, he, he later goes on to sort of to, to, to show that that's a, a real entity in, in, in humans. Um, but for the next two years, he, he's working clinically with Cushing. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of the end of their experiments together. And then, uh, when Cushing leaves to go to, to, uh, to the Brigham, uh, there's this, there's this uh, pretty intriguing story about uh, Dandy's down in the, in the lab um, getting back to his work, and Cushing comes down to ask him for his, uh, for his results. He says, I showed him to him and, put, uh, and he put him in his box um, to take him with him to the Brigham. Uh, told him they were mine, he had nothing to do with them. And then he said, well, they don't amount to anything anyway. Are you ready to start that? Can you start? All right. I, uh, 
I am the comic relief, and uh, and I want to first thank Robert for the invitation to come over here. It's really a pleasure, and uh, I have enjoyed seeing the fact that I went through Scafall, I went through the first floor here, I went through the third floor here. Nothing is the same, and some people confuse change with progress. I hear. Well, I'm supposed to have a speaker. Turn it on. Yeah. It should be on. It is on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I must hold up closer. Put the clip on it. Uh, way up. That's what the only thing you're good for. Thank you. All right. Now, can you hear me? I can hear myself now, so you must <laughs> be able to. So anyway, um, I'm just so pleased that you're the chairman and you're doing what you do. I want you to know that you're a good man. Uh, Mary Ellen, Andy Marmaduke, has been more than a pipeline of information. She's been an interpreter, and she's been willing to talk about her father in a way that gives you a lot more informa information about how he really was in that. Uh, you don't expect that such a tough, taciturn, brilliant man would be a good family man. Here he, he was wasn't a taciturn. <laughs> he had a terrible temper. <laughs> he was a good man. Uh, what I'd like to do is to... Uh, Here, just tell me when you want me to shift the slide. Okay, you can shift any time. You want this one? You want to talk about ventriculography? That's fine. You, you can back it up one. Back it up one? Back it up. No, okay, the next one. That's fine. Now, people in neurosurgery don't comprehend the breadth of a lot of their forebears as far as what they did. I mean, they, they, you read about Walter Dandy, you read about trigeminal neuralgia and acoustic tumors. And it's more than that. The, uh, I'm going to try briefly to talk about three things. My introduction to neurosurgery with a very brief history, and then I will talk more about Walter Dandy and what okay. he did. The, uh, the first thing was I got forced into neurosurgery. Anybody else ever get forced into your field? It was when I was a, a resident of, yeah, resident of surgery and an intern in Philadelphia. My boss, Dr. Ravton, got a grant to train surgical specialties with a good education in general surgery and in the laboratory. Because they were looking for a bunch of people after World War II, they couldn't find people who were well, well equipped. And after no one else would take it, of course, they asked me. So I was the first one to, to do it. Out of the 20 people over a 10 year period, uh, 19 became chairman of something. Worked out pretty well, and they never followed up. But, but I was pushed into it, and uh, I went to UCLA, and where I immediately had trouble with the chairman. It was uh, very much like Dr. Cushing, I think. And change was anathema. I had spent a lot of time with a wonderful physiologist named Saul Irokar in the lab working on the vestibular system of cats, which is really small. I thought this would be nice to use in humans. When I got out there, Bob Rand, who was number two in the department, and Ted Kersey, who was the chairman at, at uh, Southern Cal, had been working on acoustic tumors for a couple of years. Kersey had first used the microscope in clinical surgery in 1957. This was several years later, of course. This was 63. And he never published. And he never talked about it. And it was a failing of his. Rand became his Boswell. And they wrote, wrote papers together, which were mainly Rand. Uh, but they, they saw that I knew my way around the microscope and it meant that we worked as colleagues, uh, which was fun. The, the field in the 1960s had not changed tremendously in the way it was in the 1950s, 40s, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure, there were, there were advances. But there weren't magnificent advances. In that era, 
people did not want to go to a neurosurgeon if they had any kind of a major problem. Why was that? Because people were maimed, went home maimed, or they never went home. Too many. Although the neurosurgeons were doing the best they could. So that was, that was a problem. The uh, uh, feeling that uh, you ought to get to know your patients, which I've always done and have since a couple of years after that, was something I couldn't do. So I had a wall between myself and the patients with a big problem to protect my own ego. You don't know how lucky we are now. And what has happened? We've had great ideas. The great ideas are based primarily on technology. We have uh, the microscope and its variations. We have uh, neuroanesthesia as a, as a discipline. Clinical neurophysiology. Uh, imaging. We have uh, stereotactic focal radio surgery, gamma knife. These, are, these have enabled us to do things which we couldn't even think about. And if you don't have the technology, you cannot think. And if you don't know anything, you can't think. But what you want to do is to get to know things. And the more you know, the better you can think. And it causes trouble. <laughs> as long as you're doing what uh, Thomas Kuhn called normal science, it's fine. Normal science is what most of research is, which is problem solving, a known paradigm. If you look at the journals, that's what we see. Now, every once in a while, someone has a paper and a thread, a new paradigm. A new paradigm takes 20 years. 20 years, almost always. I mean, I saw, I stood the, started the trigeminal work as a, re, as a young resident. There's still people who are fussing about blood vessels and trigeminal neuralgia. It's incredible. And, and the, actually, the better the idea, the tougher it is. But what you're doing is interrupting a power base of people. Also, they have been burned by new ideas, and the neurosurgeons especially. But this has meant that things were, were different. Walter Dandy came in, and he changed neurosurgery. If you look at his, his thousand cases a year, 1,000 cases a year, about 200 were, were discs, and he was the first man to do a lumbar disc. The rest were brain problems. And he had a very good team with him. They were, they were from general surgery. They were called the brain team, and they spent 30 months with him. But he was able to do things that no one had thought about before. He saw air under the diaphragm in a patient with a ruptured valve. He said, we could put that in the brain and see things. And that was the beginning of the ventricular gram. Then he thought, well, we can put the air up from the bottom. No need to put a hole in the head. And that was the encephalogram. Well, the next one? That's, go ahead, that's the next one. You want this one too, Numo? Oh, that's all right. Numo? Or that's okay. Bad? That's okay. Okay. Next one. Now, the hydrocephalus story was something that never got worked on until he and Black Fan uh, worked together, uh, closed, obstructed the aqueduct of Sylvius, and they, they developed an internal hydrocephalus. And uh, you know, if they were young enough, the, the brain swelled the head. Uh, he had no good way to treat hydrocephalus. He did some third ventriculosities, but that was about it. And he, I don't think that he wanted that as a primary thing. Let me say something here. This drawing was done by a woman named Dorcas Hager, and she'd come, gone to Vassar, but she came to Hopkins to work with uh, the man that was the, the chief, uh, what was his name? I can't remember his name now, anyway. Bradel. Bradel, Max, Max Bradel. And Max Bradel had helped my dad with his drawings. He was German, and he'd come and he helped my dad, and then he trained Dorcas Hager. And many of these drawings that you'll see were her drawings. And actually, Ed Law still uses some of these drawings in his teaching. So, um, okay. Very good. Next. She was a very glamorous woman. She was very <laughs> tall and thin, and none of us were. <laughs> we just thought she was marvelous. Anyway, 
He always called her Miss Hager. She got married, but he always called her Miss Hager. Okay. Okay. Now, let me tell you a couple more things about what he did scientifically before, before you go back to these uh, slides. Uh, we're aware of trigeminal neuralgia. You're aware of glossopharyngeal neuralgia. And he cut nerves. Now, why didn't he move blood vessels? He probably couldn't see them well enough. He was a high myope. And they have, they have natural magnification. They're 1.25. Unless people don't have uh, hyperopia or myopia. But even he couldn't see these vessels. He took one in an eighth nerve. It didn't make the patient better, but it wasn't. We know now the, the exact clinical pathological correlation for, for veneers and all the other things. He didn't know about that. He, uh, after Cushing had published uh, papers and was well known for the fact that he did a subcapsular removal of acoustics uh, and that he thought that was the best thing and you never could take him out. Danny, very shortly thereafter, presented and published his preliminary paper on re a complete removal of acoustic tumors, which did not endear him to Dr. Cushing. I'm going to stay out of that. We don't have to talk about all that today. Uh, but this, this was the sort of thing that Walter Dandy did. And I don't think he was trying to do new stuff. I just think he was knowledgeable. He was bright. He was a good observer. And he had the you know, fund of information to be able to apply good observation to uh, neurosurgical problems. There are other problems you know about them, too. Why don't we go back okay. to you? Now, these are all Dandy first. And, um, I think I, let's see. Let me just say this too about this. Well, you'll see it later. Um, anything you want to say about, okay, here, here's the, and the acoustic tumor, Peter. You want to talk about that? Well, you can see the difference uh, in the uh, operative mortality. There's 84%, Dandy, 7.3%. And these patients not only did well immediately, but they stayed well. And the, the very good surgeons could not understand why they were killing people. They were taking the anterior inferior cerebellar artery to take it out. And that would often wipe out the patient. Well, Ed Laws told me that the Harvey Cushing, the results for people getting brain surgery, as it was called at the time, were so bad that he wanted people just to walk out alive. So he, you know, stopped without taking out the whole neurosurgery. Sure. And then um, when my dad did it, and this is another Hager drawing, um, Cushing, Cushing told him that he'd uh, lied about his results. <laughs> mentor, 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 okay. And that's how he totally removed, and this is the trigeminal neuralgia that you've talked about. That, this is another okay. Hager drawing. Uh, this is important because he thought it was a wonderful way to take care of trigeminal neuralgia. And he, and he followed up on the observation of Dandy that there was a big sensory zone which you could cut, not give total numbness to, keep sensation in the eye, and get rid of the pain. And uh, the problem was that other people couldn't do this. And so it fell into disrepute, which was sort of a shame because it would have been, now we do it, it would have been very, very much better. Thing. Remember that <coughs> looking, looking at the angle was worth about 5% as far as killing people, just looking in the days of your Same thing. Same thing, also friends of neuralgia, which you're all acquainted with. And you already heard about the aneurysm. Yeah, there's the aneurysm. This is Raphael's, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I stole this from Raphael, so that's <laughs> the aneurysm, showing the silver clip. Okay, now this, this is interesting. He developed this headlight. Apparently, Cushing had developed one, but my dad's was lighter and more manageable. And so he would operate in a darkened operating room. This is before the microscope, of course. And he would operate in the darkened operating room. And, and, um, um, and there was a story in the earlier book about how his, his orderly tripped over the toward <laughs> of the headlight. And then he'd use what we called a brace and bit. And this is when I used to watch him operate. He'd use this, this brace and bit, and he'd drill in, 
it was all pretty primitive. I mean, there were no power tools at the time. And so, um, and then this is a video of my dad operating, and supposedly it's Sir Jeffrey Jefferson from England, but there's a doctor in Holland. You know, if you, if you wait long enough, somebody's gonna say, hey, that's not true. And this doctor in Holland is just sure that that's not Jeffrey Jefferson, but wherever it is, this is what we'll do. Herman Barcala was in Buenos Aires, and he brought his brother-in-law, thank God you're here. <laughs> he brought his brother-in-law to be operated on by my dad. Okay, this is his brother-in-law, and this was a hypophyseal tumor. And Hugo Risley sent me this, and he said, I would never have had, uh, I never had the nerve to ask my dad if I could photograph anything. So we thank Furman for being so bold, and you'll see him in a minute. There's a bigger clip, but it's all about Furman. <laughs> But it's also interesting what neurosurgery looked like. And at that time, it was still called brain surgery. I don't think they started calling it neurosurgery for quite a while. That's another day, next day. He's opening his eye. And this was before there were sound movies, so um, it wasn't the, they just couldn't do sound at the time. It's the next day. His eyes fully open there. I don't have to tell you guys, you know. <laughs> so here he is getting out of bed into a wheelchair. And this is Furman Barcala, <laughs> the big show off. And on his stationery, he later put that he worked under Walter Dandy. <laughs> Came for a day, a week. What? Came for three days. So. You what? He was there for three days. I don't know, I think a week or something. Okay. <laughs> and this is, this is the headlight and the brace and bit. And his resident is assisting him. I think this is James Mason. You'll see him later. <coughs> Has anybody seen this before? That's James Mason. And I think the other one is um, Watson, one that you knew. This is whether this is Jeffrey Jefferson or not, I don't know. Somebody, he had a lot of people coming to watch him operate. This was a cerebral hypotension, I think it wasn't. And he had a wonderful nurse who was his anesthetist. And here they, I love this. <laughs> How they survived. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but there are no side rails either. What? There are no side rails. But that's sort of an interesting picture of what it looked like in those days.
And this is Mason, who is his resident. This is the guy, the last day. And this is Jeffrey Jefferson, where they're all dressed up. There's Watson. Did that look like the man you knew, Peter? I, I, it doesn't look like the pictures I've seen of him. Because you knew his grandson or somebody. Bill Watson? Is it Will Watson? Whatever. Anyway. We were trained to call Johns Hopkins Hospital, Wolf 5500, and say, would you have Dr. Watson or whoever call Dr. Dandy, please? And the residents would call every night at 7 o'clock. And except for Sunday nights when we were listening to Charlie McCarthy on the radio, they weren't allowed to call in. <laughs> so. When my dad was um, in, in his early years, um, he would go to Jekyll Island for a month in the winter. He hated the Baltimore winters. He loved the hot, humid summers. We'd all be wilting, and he'd come in from the golf course. Wasn't that wonderful? But he hated the winters that were so cold and raw. So they would have him come down to Jekyll Island, where all these rich and famous people were. And so he would take care of them for a month. And uh, he just loved it. And they he played golf, and he'd beat them at golf and everything. And one year, Harvey Cushing came down. And uh, Mike Patz wrote this, the great, two great opponents, an imperfect match. And a woman who, who uh, was watching it, Mrs. Harvey Slack, who I later knew, said, Cushing's form was the better, but Dandy won the game. I just love that. So, But he wanted all of us to be athletes. And so he taught us to play tennis and to play golf. And, and um, we all went to a private school where I also, we also played lacrosse and field hockey. And that was very important to him. He'd come to our games if he could. And he really encouraged us to be athletic. So here he is, the diagnostician. And this is what Dr. Trollin said about him. He stood at the foot of the bed and talked to the patient for a few minutes and then stated that he would take out the tumor the following day. When asked how he knew, he replied, didn't you know how he didn't blink his left eye? He was a very keen observer, as you guys are too. And this is his neurologist, Frank Ford. And at this time, there was only one neurologist and one neurosurgeon, my dad was, and he'd consult with Frank Ford. And, um, okay. And then this is Don Long, who became the chief of neurosurgery at Hopkins. Harvey Cushing was the father of neurosurgery. Walter Dandy was the father of modern neurosurgery. Today we all follow Walter Dandy, not Harvey Cushing. Now, my dad once wrote, and where this came from, James Mason, who you saw in this, his father was a doctor in Alabama. And he wrote to my dad and said how pleased he was with the training that James was getting under my dad. And my dad wrote back and said, family relations are the most important thing in life. So now we'll talk about the family. And this is me and my daddy. When I was 20, in 1929, I was two years old. And uh, I was the first daughter. And he was, and he would, after, when I was a little older than this, he, after dinner, he'd say, come lie in daddy's arms. And so I, we'd lie in his arms and he'd cuddle and talk. And so, um, and then this is a picture taken by one of his residents, Fritz, I can't remember his last name, but he was of German descent. And he came with two Leica cameras, which I still remember. And this was a color film. This is the first color picture we'd ever seen. And this is, in, this is beyond our house in Baltimore. It was just a small lot. And this was the garage next door. This isn't part of our estate. And um, so there's my brother Walter and me and my sister Kitty and my sister Maggie, who just turned 81. <laughs> So, and my mother and dad. And they had a real love affair. I mean, he, he always would bring her presents back. He'd bring her clothes. And we'd go around the corner. We'd see them hugging. We'd say, oh, yuck. You know, kids don't like to see that sort of stuff. But they were very affectionate. And here she was. She had gone to Goucher College in Baltimore as a day student. And then she went back to Iowa to train in dietetics. And she came back to Ames, Iowa. And she said, that later she said that being there really made her, in the Midwest, made her understand my dad. 
And so here they were going out to a party. We never saw them like this unless they were dressed to go to a party at the country club or something. And then here's some pictures of all of us with him. And this is my brother and, and me. And this is with Kitty and Walter. And this is my dad and Margaret. And he called her the little angel. You know, and she was, um, she was born in, in uh, this is when he was, he turned 50. And she was uh, just a baby. She was very, very, very bright. Okay, my, my dad wrote letters to all of us, and I didn't find this one out until my sister sent me this in, um, in the last fall. And instead of thinking, I can, can I do it, I think I can do it, you know. He was trying to bolster my, my sister up. She'd gone to a boarding school, and it was hard, and it was hard for her to be away from home. But he kept saying, I knew you would thrive if you got in the right environment. I gave, I gave you all those letters. And they're quite incredible. And instead of thinking I can do it, I think I can do it. I, you, you know too, the two little pigs in the milk can. One said I am lost and he drowned and the other said I know I can get out of it some way. And he paddled and paddled until he sat on a piece of butter. <laughs> so that was a letter to my sister and there are others. Um, and I thought I was kind of special, but then <clears throat> one of the letters he said, I knew you were the smartest one in the family and you're gonna be my PhD. <laughs> and he said, and Mary Ellen is just leading such a gay life, too gay. She was out till midnight and her friends came and it's two o'clock. And so I come out looking like sort of a social butterfly. And so until I had that, I thought that I was sort of the special one. But obviously we were all special in some way. And he would take us to the hospital and we'd visit the patients and we'd watch him operate. And he was very proud of us. And he said, I remember that little yellow dress you, went, you wore when you, to me when you went to see my patients. And so, and this is an interesting story. He was a great baseball fan, and when he was um, at Hopkins, he'd been president, he'd been uh, captain of the team of Johns Hopkins baseball team. And I remember Al Blaylock still calling him captain. In fact, in that big book, um, Neil Grauer point shows that picture of this inscription with Al Blaylock saying to the captain. And um, Blaylock came from He'd, had, he'd been a urology student at Hopkins, and then he got TB and he had to go to Saranac and recover. And when he came back, he went to Vanderbilt, and then he came back to Hopkins to be the chief of surgery, and he was quite a bit younger than my dad. And one night after he'd moved, come to the, back to Baltimore, they were neighbors of ours, and one night my dad had planned to have my sister Kitty and me have our appendix out the following Monday, and that Thursday, I just, or Friday, I had this terrible stomach ache, and so my dad called Al Blaylock, and he said, would you come down and took, take a look at Mary Ellen, I think. And so they decided to take me in that night to the hospital, the two of them, and they put on the gas, and I had my appendix taken out, and Kitty came the next day and had hers taken out. And I, it was years before I wanted to have another anesthetic, and fortunately I didn't need to. But anyway, he was a great baseball fan, and so, he would go up to New York on the train to watch the Yankees and the Dodgers. And Larry McPhail of the Brooklyn Dodgers asked him and George Bennett, George Bennett was the orthopedic surgeon at Hopkins, to design a baseball cap so that the baseball players wouldn't be beamed in their temporal lobe. And so they designed this hat. And I remember this huge piece of four by six feet plastic coming. I'd never seen plastic before. And it came and we put it on the dining room table and my dad just said, okay, take care of this. And so my mother, I'm sure, cut it because it was pretty thick. And then my sister Kitty and I sewed it into the helmet. And that's now at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. But he, he got all the credit, but we did all the work. <laughs> and then, then during the, second, in the First World War, he wanted to go into the ambulance corps, but Hopkins wanted him to stay at Hopkins because so many of the men were going into the, in the Army to, to Europe. And so um, he stayed, and that's where he, he realized that so many people had ruptured appendix and why he was determined to get ours taken out before uh, they got the problem, or supposedly. And so um, his job as a Dollar Year man was to go around to all the different naval hospitals and check on the neurosurgery services there. And um, the, this man on his left is um, Wink Craig, who was at, at Mayo, and he said, 
Wink knows all the neurosurgeons, but I know the movie stars. And this is Dorothy L'Amour. And my dad had operated on her, her mother. And her name was Mrs. Castleberry, but he always called her Mrs. Cranberry. He was terrible in names. You know that, Peter. <laughs> he knew sort of the name, but he could tell you exactly what somebody's problem was, but he couldn't remember their names. And so Dorothy L'Amour, this is my dad and Dorothy L'Amour. And then here in the middle is um, Admiral John Jack Warner, who was uh, head of Warner Brothers, and he gave us a pass to all the Warner Brothers pictures. And here he is with, uh, there's my dad, and then behind my dad is this man, Emil Sellis, who did the bus, and you, the one that you have, you know, that he was the one that did that. And he was a neurosurgeon, but he also did the first book, the first bust of my dad based on the uh, life mask that is in the archives. Probably saw that, and I saw that. And it's really, she said it was really kind of creepy because, you know, there was the bump on his head, the little bubble thing. And so anyway, um, but he said, um, and then that was Ronald Reagan when he was a movie star. It was King's Row was the movie. And here he was going to Hawaii and my mother had hoped to go, but then my brother had opened a Coca-Cola bottle on a rock and it exploded, a warm Coca-Cola bottle exploded, and his eye was severely damaged. And so he was, my mother stayed home to take care of him and my father went. And um, he said, you know, he would bring us all grass skirts when he came back. And so he came back, he loved Hawaii, and he loved the music, and he came back with, all, with grass skirts for each of us and then he would put on the Hawaiian music and my mother just hated that music. And so he would take two grass skirts to go around his waist and then he would show us how to hula. He wasn't afraid of being silly with us and he could be very silly. And we'd go to this place in West Virginia and we'd, in the summer because we couldn't drive to New Hampshire or Maine. And so <clears throat> we'd go to this place and, 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 and there's a picture of him in that place called Cape and Springs. And, um, um, but anyway, he, he brought, we'd bring back snuff and chewing tobacco and we'd sit around playing cards and we'd chew on the tobacco and he kept saying it gets better and it'd all be drooling on our mouth <laughs> and of course it never got better it was just awful but he loved seeing us suffer and so you know he was just he was great fun oh wait a minute that's and so Neil Grauer who wrote the book about about Johns Hopkins neurosurgery said Marion I'm not sure that was that was uh, his, the pediatrician, Edwards Park. Edwards Park had worked with my dad on neurosurgery. And I'm sure he was the go-to guy to, to write the obituary. So it may not be true, but it's good enough to tell. Gruff of manner, hard of temper, hot of temper, and endowed with a tongue as sharp as his instruments, beneath the hard exterior, a deep vein of tenderness. And another story I want to tell you, too, is at night, if he wanted to fall asleep, he would pay us 10 cents an hour to rub his head and a quarter if we could slip, slip, slip off the bed before he w and didn't wake him up. I don't ever remember collecting, but he paid us to do that. So um, now this is interesting too. A couple of years ago at the AANS, did you see this, Rob, Robert? Anyway, they did this sort of face off with Ed Laws being uh, Harvey Cushing and Jim Goodrich being my dad, and I, Jim Goodrich had responded to an article that um, um, Mike Patz wrote, and I wrote him, and I said, you know, I'd really like to meet you, and he said, I'm coming to Portland to visit my family. I grew up in Portland. And so Jim came, and apparently he shaved off his beard before they actually did this show. And Jim came to Portland, and he walked and looked out my window, and he said, oh my God, there's a place that builds barges that's right, I'm right on the river. And there's a place that's built barges now that used to be shipbuilding. He said, I used to sneak in there when I was in high school. So Jim is a really great guy and we got to be great friends. He comes every Christmas and we visit. And I said, he said, I have lots of questions. Why don't we go for lunch? And so we went to lunch for this Vietnamese restaurant in my building. And I knew that Jim had left, had dropped out of high school and gone to Vietnam as a sharpshooter. And we were sitting in this restaurant and I said, well, Jim, how did you decide to become a neurosurgeon? And he said, well, I came in out of the field in Vietnam, Vietnam and 
this man was just screaming in pain, and I said, this medic stuck something into his scalp, and immediately the man felt better. And Jim said to him, what do you do in civilian life? He said, I'm a neurosurgeon. So Jim then had to go back to community college and then medical school, and now he travels all over the world separating conjoined twins. And this is another funny story. He has all these miles, and so United treats him like a special person. And he, somebody said to him, well, why do they treat you so specially? He said, I'm Ben Carson's campaign manager. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, Ben Carson has faded from view. But it's interesting, when I met Ben Carson, when Raphael was being installed, I said, uh, Dr. Carson, my father was a non-believer, and I'm a non-believer, but I practice the Christian ethic. And he said, you can't. And I thought, good grief, you know, what's that about? And the next year he came when Raphael and I were giving a talk, and he realized I wasn't just a socialite, that I had some talents. And, so he came up and shook my hand and said, wouldn't your father have loved this technology? So um, further reading, you know, I was a teacher for 10 years in a high school in Portland, and I was in the high school where we could see Mount St. Helens, and Mount St. Helens erupted. And when I was on, a, on, on the Columbia River on a cruise, floating on a sailboat, and so when I came back, um, you know, I could see it from the, from the school where I taught, a very interesting school. Anyway, this is um, started by a team from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And this is the Cushing Dandy conflict, and this is what Mike Patz wrote, and it's available through World Neurosurgery. And then these are the books written about my dad. This is the one that was in, 19, in, 2000, in 1984, and we all went back to New York, and that's where we first met Ed Laws. And, um, it was, we all stayed in the same hotel, and they had the uh, CNS reception on an aircraft carrier, which was quite an experience. And then this is the book, that the second edition of the book that I wrote, that actually my sister wrote, and um, that came out in this fall when we were in, um, in New Orleans. And I was supposed to sign books there, but Rudy Giuliani was the Walter Dandy orator, and he was supposed to speak for 20 minutes, and he spoke for 40, by the time I got to the, to the stand where they were, I was supposed to sign a book, everybody had gone for lunch. So, so um, anyway, that's that book. And then this book is, if any of you have read this book about Harvey Cushing by Michael Bliss, it's so beautifully written, I sputtered all the way through it. And I wrote to him, and he said, Miriam, I'm just telling Harvey Cushing's story. I wrote to Michael Bliss. And I sent him that picture. He said, I'm transcribing, putting that picture of the family, and so I sent it to him in color. And then he wrote, this is what he wrote uh, in this book that Neil Grauer, he said, um, thanks to Harvey Cushing, Johns Hopkins Hospital became the birthplace of effective neurosurgery more than a century ago. Thanks to Walter Dandy, Johns Hopkins became the birthplace of daring and imaginative neurosurgery. Thanks to their outstanding successes, Earl Walker, Donald Long, Henry Brim, Ben Carson, and many others, Johns Hopkins continues as the innovative leadership in all aspects of his remarkable and special field. And Neil is interesting because uh, he went to the archives to do work on my dad, and they said, if you want information about Walter Dandy, call, contact Mary Ellen, because she's been here doing work on her book. And so Neil and I have become great friends, and we just emailed, and we didn't meet till we met in New Orleans, and he was this book had, he didn't have a full, full copy of the book, but he took orders for it. And it's a fantastic book, don't you, didn't you find, Robert? It's really amazing. And he actually quotes me, which I was stunned by, but, and I just had an email from him about all sorts of things that are going, so we still are in touch. And he's just, his emails are, he has a marvelous sense of humor. And then this is the book about Peter. This is the first edition. And there's a later book, um, and I remember you said you'd go to the tavern and you say, I'm Pete from Pitt, right? Yeah. Is there a ukulele? I play the banjo. Well, your banjo. I didn't know yeah. I did anything else. Yeah. So anyway, that's a really neat book if any of you haven't read that, now that you've met the guy. And so other online resources. The, there are letters of my, from my dad, but I gave Robert the ones that have the salutations, the one that I did. And then there are the recent ones that my, he wrote to Kitty. And then, I don't know if they're online, but 
then I wrote this, Jim Goodrich urged me to write this article because he said there's nothing that people can search on Google and find an article in PubMed. And um, so then I, I wrote the book and then I wrote this retrospective. And then if you go to Wikipedia, Rafael Tamargo goes on every two weeks to clean up stuff that people put in, you know, because anybody can write anything. Thank you. Thank you.